This week, a lecture on the American Revolution and its weaponry, including the Brown Bess muzzle loading smoothbore musket, the most commonly used weapon in the American Revolution. This is a replica of a 1756 flintlock musket. Great. It's about four and a half feet long, weighs about eight to ten pounds. It's about, and this is standard, uh, standard issue. You will have this, you will own this, and you will love this. Don't lose it. Don't break it. The lecture from Baylor University with Professor Julie Ann Sweet begins in a moment. When we last met, you all declared independence. So that means we have to go to war. Right? And so in order to do that, we need to recruit our troops, we need to train them, we need to drill them, we need to arm them, all those sorts of good things. Before we do that, I want to talk just briefly about military history in general. We're going to set aside our political, our political history for now. Next couple weeks, it's military history, all full, stuff, all full go, all right? So here's the thing. There's certain challenges that folks who study military history are going to encounter. Like what? What are some of the things that you can see military historians having problems with running into? Yeah. Uh, history being written by the winners. Yeah. I like to change it up and say, to the winners go the history, right? Because what they end up doing is they're the ones that are going to tell the story, all right? Of course, unless you're doing the Civil War. Uh, but this is, the way, this is the way it usually works, and so you usually get their perspective, all right? We're going to see that a lot in this war, where you've got a lot of the patriots, a lot of the American Revolution stuff, all right? One of the reasons why I had you read the spring chapter was so you can get the British perspective, because their version's just a little bit different. So, what other challenges you got to run into? Other things, Kate. Okay. Uh, there isn't a lot of certainty with like who won what battle and all that stuff. You do run into some uncertainties. Right? Again, lots of different perspectives here. Right? You may have some bias. Generals like to make themselves look good. Wars are nice for promotion. Uh, and so, so yeah, so you've got to be really careful about your sources. As historians, you know that. You know you don't take everything at face value. You also got to be careful with the military guys. Just because they're generals, just because they're officers, doesn't mean they're always right. Okay. Uh, anything else? Other things? So, okay. Um, you also have issues with, like, how it's a, trying to reconstruct a battle because, like, so much is going on and there's so much chaos because, like, people are shooting and there's death. So, <laughs> sure. It is very chaotic, all right? Yes, you're going to walk in with a plan, all right? Yes, you are going to have certain objectives that you want to obtain, but like we were talking about with, with, uh, the, ba- with the Battle of Bunker Hill, okay, who won? Well, the British take the field, but they take the higher casualties, so I'm not really sure. We're going to run into that a lot here, all right? Wars are messy. Battles are challenging. We're not really sure how things change up, all right? And everybody's perspective is different depending on where you're at. If you're a private in the front lines, your version's going to be a whole lot different than a general sitting on the horse way back on the hill, all right? Anything else? Other problems? Okay. Differences in how battles are fought over time? Sure. <laughs> and it is, you got to remember the time period, folks. This is something we're going to mention several times today. You have to remember the time period. What year is it? 76. All right. We are in 76. And I'm actually going to back it up a year for us um, because we need to create our army, get us going, all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, 76, 75. Nevertheless, that's where we're at, right? You need to remember what people wear, what people carry, how they use this, what your objectives are, what you can do. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen, all right? Think backwards. This is early modern era. So we have much more in common with those folks, the medieval folks, uh, your early modern folks, than anybody else that's coming here on. There's a lot of technology that changes in the 19th and 20th centuries. We're not going there. Haven't heard of it. Don't know what it's about. Okay. So uh, we're going to stick to this. So remember your time period. Things are very different. Very close combat, not a whole lot of range, all that kind of good stuff. So, um, so that'll be really important, too. So the good thing about military history is that it's becoming really popular nowadays. Uh, we are on the up and up. Um, unfortunately, 
you have been in some sort of military conflict your entire lives. Uh, and so this is something that you're accustomed to, used to. It's part of everyday life on the news and whatnot, right? Um, and that's a good thing for military historians because it makes it much more popular. 30, 40 years ago, this was not a subject you could talk about for all sorts of different reasons. But we can now. It's getting really popular. We're working to push the envelope here at Baylor, too. Uh, so we're doing our thing, doing our part as far as military history is concerned. So if this is your thing, this is your moment, folks. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so enjoy it. Get on board um, as far as that's concerned. So we do run into special challenges as far as the American Revolution is concerned. Concerned. Big thing is going to be sources. Right. Going back to the fact that you've got this, it's chaotic, you've got your bias, your uncertainties, all that sort of stuff. Add to the fact that we don't have a whole lot of guys that wrote things down. Right? Joseph Plum Martin, that we're going to read towards the end of the semester, fabulous guy, great book, one person out of all the folks that served. Right? Um, Sure, we've got a couple documents from Washington and a couple of the other guys, but as we were saying, that's a very small snippet as far as what all these different folks, what happened, what they experienced, all that sort of stuff. So, so that's going to be a real problem. Um, we're also going to have to work around a lot of mythology. Think about it. Valley Forge. All of a sudden, y'all start thinking, right, oh, it's snowy and the cold and the, you know, wrapping their feet up in bandages and all that sort of thing. And that's legit. That happened, okay? I'm not making it up. But nevertheless, you've got this whole kind of aura, like, ooh, patriots, good guys, ding. Not so much, okay? These guys did some atrocities on both sides. When we get to the war in the South, it gets really messy. It gets really ugly on both sides, all right? So you got to remember there's a lot of, you know, I don't hate on George Washington, but he did make some mistakes here. He's going to make quite a few, as a matter of fact. Um, kind of a little preview, things to come. So, um, so we do need to watch out for that. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's also very much an East Coast thing. We're in Texas. When I say revolution, y'all are probably thinking Alamo. Um, but different revolution, folks. Um, this one, this is, this is the guys on the East Coast. Um, and so we're a little far and we from that so would love to take a staff ride out that way. Not happening, though. But, okay, so there's that. Um, so, yes, so remember this. It's, it's very different here in 1775. Battles are small. They're very close. There's all sorts of difficulties, challenges that are very different from what you may be used to from other wars, more modern conflicts and whatnot. So, um, so there's that. All right. So this is just military history in general, things to think about as f before as we move forward. So, let's set up our two sides. All right. Yeah, we're going there. All right. Let's talk the British first. And yes, I'm intentionally using red. Um, what sorts of advantage do our British folks have? What have they got on us? Ryan? They have an established officer corps. Uh, yeah. And they're actually pretty good. <clears throat> these guys know what they're, they're professionals. These are guys that have been doing it for 30, 40 years on many different continents. This is not the first war. This is not their first rodeo, folks. All right. Um, and so, yeah, so they've got the experience. They've got the know-how. They can change things up. All right. We like to think that these guys, they came in there blind. They didn't know what they were doing. They were wedded to the book and all that kind of stuff. That's not the case. These guys are good, all right? And we need to take, we need to realize that, appreciate it. Uh, what other advantages have they got? So we have the biggest naval. Oh yeah, can we say Navy? Hello. Yes, the Royal Navy. Ha! Let's talk about them. <clears throat> Two hundred and seventy warships. How many of the Americans got? None. None. Thank you, France. All right. Uh, but yeah, we don't have. This, this is going to be a huge, this is one of the reasons why we will not engage on the high seas, because we know we can't win there, all right? Um, but the Navy is also hugely important for transport. They can get supplies. They can move men and materiel. They can get all sorts of things different places and whatnot, all right? Um, and yeah, we, this is definitely something that's in their side that we're just, 
there's no way we can catch up to them. So, anything else? Other things? So, yeah. They sort of have kind of the offensive initiative. They are working. <laughs> They're playing offense. Um, okay. And they're they're going there they're they have to they have to subdue a continent we'll talk about that um, but nevertheless they're they have the might on the on their side um, as far as that's concerned so what else other things so Ken. Um, they have more training yeah. lots of training goes back to your officer corps they've also got going along with that to contingent with your royal navy the army 55,000 soldiers strong. Again, very good at what they do. Don't want to say, I mean, okay, one of the great things about Matthew Spring's article shows you just how diverse this force is. We always like to joke about like, oh, the British Army, they're this well-oiled machine that's just going to come in like some, you know, um, bulldozer and take over the colonies and whatnot. And that's not necessarily the case, all right? These are men too, all right, that are, you know, fighting for a paycheck and whatnot, doing, going, doing their duty and, and all that. But, and they've got their issues. They've got their reasons why they're doing this, all right? Um, because these rebels are rebels, um, and they're getting uppity as far as being Englishmen is concerned. So, nevertheless, they are very good and have lots of training. So, Mel, question? Uh, they also have the military mindset. They were ready to deploy versus, like, the Americans. Yes, they are going along with your training. Yeah. We are starting from square one on every possible front, all right? We have no government. We've got 13 random colonies that aren't talking to each other. Um, you're going to have also, you know, you, uh, it's, it's a mess on that side. Nevertheless, these guys, yeah, they're, they're ready to go. I mean, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. They've been deployed here in the colonies before. Um, and so, yeah, they're just, they're, they're well-trained. They're, they're, excellent at what they do so um, okay going back to my soldiers we got about 55,000 of those who else is fighting in this army besides British soldiers those Hessians yes um, we're going to have about 30,000 Hessians now before we go complaining about Hessians all right where is this coming from Right. George III and all those Georges they're from the House of Hanover they're, they're German they've got that in their background these folks are they're mercenaries. They're guns for hire. Everybody does this. This is classic standard European tactics to, to go ahead and hire these guys. All right. Sure, maybe it looks bad from the colonial side of things, but this is just this is the way they operate. Okay. Look at the numbers, folks. Now, not all of these folks are going to be deployed in the colonies at the same place at the same time, but they've got that in their background. All right. Going off of that too, they've also got the population to draw from. About 9 million people living in uh, England right now, all right? You got a lot of folks. And again, about two and a quarter of those are eligible for service. But nevertheless, they got people that they can replace. The colonies, you've got about 2 million folks in all of the colonies. And that's including men, women, children, and slaves, all right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's, they've got the numbers to go along with this too. So, um, all right, so we got a lot of military. What else have they got? It's working for them. So everything's standardized. Mm -hmm. the, whether it's uniforms or guns, artillery, they're, they're, it's not they're, it's not piecemeal. Sure, and they're again, it's 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 just a new war, new place is the thing. They've done this before um, elsewhere. So yeah, so they're going with that too. So um, yeah, Kevin. Going along with that, they have a well-practiced system of quartermasters. Sure, <laughs> supply. Oh. Now, supply will be a bit of a challenge for them. Something that you need to remember is that there's a big ocean in the way, all right? Yes, they are able to use Canada. Yes, they are able to use their West Indies. This is where the Royal, Royal Navy comes in. Nevertheless, it's a long way back to England for orders, okay? Think back to poor uh, General Gage, who's stuck in Boston, waiting to find out what happens and what do I do now? Uh, well, it's it's... He's got to wait for that. Same thing goes with supplies. We're going to see this several times where things, they're going to have to pull back because they need to make sure they got an exit strategy. So, um, Other things we're not thinking about. Okay, this is all military stuff, and I get that. But you also need to remember they've got 
a government and an economy, both of which that can support a long-term military operation. Again, what do the colonies got? A bunch of assemblies, and they just threw out all their governors. All right. Good luck with that. Um, the Declaration of Independence, we read it. You voted on it. Don't remember reading about a government in there. All right. Just a list of why King George is a bad guy. All right. um, so meanwhile, again, these guys, they hundreds of years they've been doing this, folks. So they know what they're doing. They're ready to go. Game on, as far as their group is concerned. So Now, before we all surrender... <laughs> and yell, God save the king. There are some things working on our advantage as well. Like what? What do we got? Home field advantage. We do. <laughs> you got to know your terrain. You're going to hear me say this over and over again. You've got to know your terrain. Never go to war without a good map. All right? These guys, yes, they know what they're doing. Maybe they've been here before, but we know all those rocks and creeks and trees and Indian paths and whatnot, and they're not so sure about that. All right? So we've got that. Going along with that, we also have lots of territory because we are on defense. As long as Washington has an army in the field, the United States exists. All right. And if you look at that map, there's a lot of places that he can hide. There's a lot of places that you can go to. All right. He's not, when you look at the win-loss column, he's not going to have a whole lot in the win column. All right. Nevertheless, he's still there. Drag it out. All right. Take as long as you can. Then, that way, wear them down, and eventually maybe they'll give up as the thing. All right? doesn't sound like the most honorable, fancy way to win a war, but it gets the job done, and that's all that matters. So, uh, We have more on the line in regards to like, uh, pride and principles, like and what we want. Sure. And our peeps are watching. <laughs> all right, definitely. This is, we like to call it the cause. your flag or whatever you want to call it. But yes, there is, there's a reason. Besides being a home field advantage, it's your home. It's your family. It's your farm. It's why you came here. You're going to fight tooth and nail to defend that. All right? And again, when we get further into the South, a lot of times that's all it's going to come down to is which colors is burning your cornfield. And that's who, you're, that's who your enemy is. All right? It's going to get real personal. It's going to get real partisan by that point in time. so. Um, but nevertheless, that really does motivate us. Sure, they got the numbers, they got the training, but they got nothing at stake here, all right, really. Um, these guys, they do. That's where it's at. This is home, all right? And they don't want to be a conquered people. Ick. So, uh, anything else? Other advantages? Building off of that, this is kind of a disadvantage too, but they're close enough to get orders, like, relatively quickly. Sure. And they're also close to, like, their farms and stuff, which is, like, the disadvantage part of it. Sure, the supply lines are much shorter. And Washington's going to make sure you don't steal from neighbors, all right? got to work for it. That's the thing. One of the reasons why Valley Forge is such a mess is because farmers want to make the most money, so they sell to the British. Which doesn't sound very patriotic, but they got to make money, too, all right? So that's where they go with that. So, um, so supply lines are shorter. Communication lines are shorter. We just got to run to Philadelphia, check with the Congress, see what's up. Um, whereas instead of waiting months and years to be able to get something from overseas um, is also an important part of that. So anything else, other advantages, Frank? Uh, you have the prospect of foreign alliances. <laughs> yeah. And who in particular are we going to look for? French. French. Yeah. Oh. That was French. All right. Yes, Canada and Quebec are the lost colony. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the French, are, they're looking for revenge. They've hated the British for time immemorial. So yeah, this is a chance for them to get back at them. Um, France may try a little backstabbing later on, but yeah. So, um, but we do have that. England, yes, they are the biggest, baddest empire in the world, which means everybody hates them. All right. So we can use that to our advantage, get some help on our side, because believe me, we need help. 
big time. So, um, anything else? Any other things? Um, a lot of areas, there's a friendly population. The civilians. All right. And again, it goes back to the fact this is home. All right. And Washington really does insist that his men treat them, treat them well, treat them nicely, uh, is part of that thing. So um, to make, sh- whereas the British, they just kind of trounce all over them, take advantage of their loyalist uh, compatriots um, when they really should have treated them with a bit more respect, perhaps. So, um, and yeah, so, right. Um, I just want to say, I think the militia is really unique uh-huh. because it gives the Americans this they actually have a lot of fighting experience, but it also gives them the ability to quickly mobilize, um, whereas the Redcoats, they need to ship troops over or pull, you know, pull from loyalist population pools. But the militia can instantaneously organize, and they can just fade back in to the communities. Yeah, they're one of this, and this goes to our, our tactics. One of the things that's different for us is maybe what you'd call guerrilla tactics or whatnot. Oops. <clears throat> It'll eventually be an American way of war. Where, yeah, we hide behind rocks and trees and all that sort of thing. But yes, you deploy your local militia to be able to be your defense force right then and there when you need them. Um, and that's their advantage, right? We'll talk a little bit more here in a moment about the differences between the militia and the Continental Army. And we need to have those two work together. But nevertheless, you have a force that you can call on at a minute's notice, literally, um, whereas British, not so much, uh, is the thing. So, I mean, again, going back to these, these guys know their, their terrain, they know where their friends are, they can get their supplies, all of that helps work to our advantage. And the British have to destroy all of this to be able to win is the trick. So, am I missing anything? Uh, does the fact that we have less soldiers make it better for us, like, in regards to military leaders trying to conserve, like, the death toll, like, I don't know. Right, the fact that we have fewer of them, use, do we use them more carefully, sparsely, that sort of thing? It does help as far as mobility is concerned, but it's not necessarily, I mean, If this were a mass casualty event, then no. Um, But since we are close combat, our numbers are going to be small. We're talking like a couple hundred thousand guys in the field at one time. So um, so a little bit of a mix there. Depends on the battle is the thing. So anyways, anything else as far as advantages, whatnot? Okay. Yeah, question. Well, this isn't really a military advantage, but it does help that we came um, in the wake of the Enlightenment period in where we have like... um, Printed rights, human rights, and we can see clearly that they're being um, trampled on by Britain. So it gives us more like patriotic pride and passion going into the war. Sure, and it goes back to our pride, our principles, and the fact that we've got not just shorter su- supply lines, but communication lines, and we can play on that. We own the newspapers. We've got the press, and the press is hugely important. They're the ones that are going to be able to swing public opinion one way or another, and so they can, you know, yes, we're going to have patriot presses. Not so much as loyalist presses is the thing. Um, And play on that rights thing. That's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for specific objectives, all right, Um, for land, for rights, for economic opportunities, all those sorts of things. These guys, not so much, all right. This is, you know, this is a job, this is a deployment for them um, as far as all that's concerned. So, okay. Now that we've gotten our two sides together, and yeah, we're doing this, all right, we need to talk about the guy, the person who's going off to fight this war, is the thing. So, to do that, we need to talk about our material. There are two hugely important pieces to be able to make an army work. You need the man and need the weaponry. All right. So what we need to do is figure out how that weaponry works. What I'm passing out is our manual of arms. All right. How to operate this machine. It also helps that they're warming up the projector. So I'm going to pass some extras back in case I missed some back there. So Secondly... I would be a poor supply officer if I did not provide cartridges for your weapons. All right. 
So everybody grab one of these, pass them around and whatnot. <coughs> so we'll get to those here in a sec. Don't get ahead of me. So, so. <clears throat> all right. So my uniform today, I am Continental Army, all right? And difference between how you can tell, I'm just ordinary, ordinary soldier. Um, it's pretty much because we create the Army in June of 75, it's a motley crew. We kind of wear whatever we've got and whatnot. Um, it is your, your britches, your linen shirt, your linen waistcoat, and then your coat over top of it. Wool, by the way. Um, it's your interface here that's going to tell you what color, what your, what your rank is. Um, red is more of your privates and ordinary soldiers. Gold or, more, or yellows are going to be your officers and whatnot. So one thing that everybody's going to need is your musket. This right here. State of the art, my friends. This is it. All right. This is a replica of a 1756 flintlock musket. All right. It's about four and a half feet long. Weighs about eight to ten pounds. All right. It's about, and this is standard, uh, standard issue. You will have this. You will own this. And you will love this. Don't lose it. Don't break it. All right. Um, is the thing. It consists of three parts. Your lock, which is this metal mechanism right here. Your stock, which is the wooden part right here, and your smooth bore barrel, which is this long metal tube right here. All right. Hence the phrase lock, stock, and barrel, right? It means the whole thing, whole kit and caboodle here. It's important to note that this barrel is a smooth bore. It means that it's just a long tube of metal. All right. um, it is not grooved. When something is rifled, what that means is that there's grooves in here. Right? When you put a ball in there and the grooves would snug down, give it a spin, all right, which means you can actually aim this. You can't do that with this weapon. That's not the point. All right? It's the thing. So uh, what we're going to do is walk through the manual of arms so you see how we operate this thing. This is why training is going to be so important. So we can all work together in conjunction to be able to win the battle is the thing. All right, so <clears throat> here we go. Uh, first thing you need to do is half cock your weapon. What you do is you pull your flint back into the half cock position. You cannot fire a weapon in this position, hence the phrase, do not go off half cocked. Just not possible. All right. Then what you're going to do is handle your cartridge. You reach back into your cartridge box over here and pull out one of the cartridges, which is what all of you guys have. All right. Your cartridge consists of three things, the paper, black powder, and a musket ball. All right. Musket balls look like this. Large lead ball like so. All right. You would make this in bullet molds while you're sitting in camp and whatnot. Bullets are different sizes, 50 caliber, 80 caliber, and anywhere in between. Um, and it is solid lead. Lead melts at a low temperature, so that's one of the reasons you can use this size thing. So, all right. Um, in order, after you've handled your cartridge, what you need to do is called prime the pan. That's this metal piece right here. All right. We need to put some powder in here. So what you're going to do is you need to bite the tail off. If you're going to be a soldier, you need to have two opposing teeth. It's one of the few things past the physical. So you bite off your tail. All right. And if you do bite off your tails, you can do that too. Um, and then you're going to pour some powder into the pan right here. Okay. So this is not real black powder. This is Folgers coffee. <laughs> as much as we want to re renovate Tidwell, blowing the side of the wall <laughs> is probably not the way to go about doing that. All right. So we got some black powder in our pan. Next thing you need to do is shut the pan. I'm taking this steel pan right here. I'm going to close it up like that. All right. And what you need to do is charge your cartridge. So you turn this around, and you will pour the ball and the powder and everything back in here, down the barrel. All right. Ram your car draw your rammer, which is this metal piece right here. Pull this out. Ram your cartridge, which means put it down here, down the tube. Make sure you get it all the way down. Return your rammer. Don't lose this. Don't leave it in there either. Shoulder your cartridge, your fire lock. All right, next thing you do is poise it, which means you turn it. Next thing you do is full cock it, pull it all the way back. Present means you point it in the general direction of the enemy. <laughs> And then, fire. Shut your eyes, pull the trigger. Okay. Why did I close my eyes? 
What's happening right in front of them is an explosion. Okay. What happens here is the, is the flint hits the steel frizzen, have, causes the sparks. The sparks then light the black powder, which goes down the little touch hole, which then lights the powder that we put down the barrel, causes the explosion that sends our, our ball that direction some way, hopefully, okay, <laughs> is the thing. A good man on a good day can do this in 20 seconds. All right, how long is 20 seconds? Let's see about that. One. Now remember, you're on a battlefield where there's other things happening, like people shooting at you, and cannons going off, and drums being drummed, and people charging, and horses, and all sorts of other things happening. Bang. 20 seconds, good man, good day. All right, that means four shot, three shots a minute. <laughs> you can't do math, be a history major. <laughs> okay, so there you go. What are some of the problems with this weapon? It takes forever. 20 seconds is a long time. That's why we counted it out, all right? It goes on and on and on. So it does, it's a very, and if you do something wrong somewhere along the way, it's not going to work. This is one of the reasons why training is so important. It's a very precise mechanism, all right? Trust me, as a kid who's double-charged their weapon before, you don't want to do that. All right. What else? Other problems you're going to run into? Does it work in the rain? <laughs> then there's the weather, yes. Um, you may have heard the phrase, keep your powder dry. Okay, that's the point, all right? If you have a rain shower, then yes. The, the paper gets wet, the powder gets wet. I've, marched in the rain before where you've had to cover up your cover up your lock and do the best that you can but nevertheless weather is going to be a huge factor in this all right uh, what else other problems you got so. it's bulky it is it's it's very awkward um, one of the good things about wearing a uniform like this is that it gives you all an idea of what you're working with all right not only are you going through all these different steps and whatnot but you're doing it in these clothes all right um, so yeah, there is a lot of there's a lot of steps involved, um, and it is it's it's awkward, it's heavier on one side, all that thing, all that sort of thing is a problem. So what else or thing? Um, if you lose a part of it, or if it gets like messed up in any way, you're kind of screwed. Yes, so. yeah, like I kept saying, don't lose this, don't break this, all that kind of thing. All right, remember what time period it is? What year is it? 1775. Okay, so this right here is a handcrafted work of art created by a gunsmith who made lock, stock, and barrel, every piece of this, by hand. Each one's going to be individually different. This is why I'm saying don't lose it. Name it. Okay. Um, because it's, you know how this sort of thing operates. If you break something, you lose a part, whatever, you can't necessarily you know, just run to the nearest gunsmith and have him fix it or whatever. Right? So that's going to be a problem, too. This is, it's, it's a very, otherwise, it's just going to be a very heavy club. Um, essentially, if you if you break something, so uh, anything else? Other problems you can foresee here, Joel? I mean, it's a very low likelihood of being able to hit anyone at a greater distance. So, out of the full minutes worth of three shots, like maybe one might hit someone. Sure, it's a very inexact science. Do you put enough powder down here? It's one of the reasons why the barrel is so long and it is so bulky is that you need the range. The longer your barrel, the longer you can get it. Probably about fifty yards is how well you're going to be able to hit something with this. All right, 50 yards, when you leave here today and you go out the front steps of Tidwell, stop and look across, and it's going to be about to Burleson. All right, that's how close your enemy is going to be, is the thing. So, yes, you do two, three shots, and then while you're advancing, and then you charge with your bayonet, and that's it. Like I was saying, remember the time period. This is very close combat. But that's the best you can do with this is the thing because it is a smooth bore and that ball just goes bouncing out the other end and hopefully hits something over there maybe is the thing so other problems other things you see um flints wear out sure your flint you're gonna have to replace this oh i don't know every 10 12 shots or so depending on how good your flint is but nevertheless yeah this can break split lost one before so yeah it's there's certain things that can happen to that too so uh anything else other problems you can see no user error yeah operator error Always a problem. Um, if you, again, and this is 
it is very complicated. This is one of the reasons why you train and you drill and then you train and then you drill and then you do it again uh, is the thing. Because there's all these different steps that go along the way. This is the shorter version of this, all right? The longer version that the British are using uh, is actually out here in our printed manual of arms. It takes about 36 steps. It's going to be a lot longer than 20 seconds, I can tell you that. Uh, but thank you, Baron von Steuben, for sneaking it down a little bit, so, uh, is the thing. But yeah, it's just, there's lots of things that can go wrong with this, um, is a problem, too. Uh, I don't know if anybody's used black powder, for instance. Um, black powder, very gummy, very sticky. Um, it's not, it's gonna gum up. There's lots of problems. You can, well, I've got my whisk and pick here to that, be able to clear things out, uh, as best as I can for, um, to get the powder out of my, out of my pan and whatnot, so. Uh, anything else? Other problems you can foresee here? So, okay. I have a question. Sure. Did the Continentals have bayonets, or is it just the British that charged? We all do, actually. I'm okay. um, glad you mentioned that. So, but more questions about our musket. Let's move on. Okay. So the bayonet will actually go on the end. You'll see this little knob right here. All right. This is not a sight. You cannot aim this weapon, so you don't need one. It's another reason why you close your eyes. You're not actually like you're pointing it in the general direction of the enemy. You can't really pick somebody off with it. So, um, so yes. So what we have is the socket bayonet, and that's this item right here. Right. Um, and what you do is you lock it into place, and then once you've advanced on the enemy far enough, you will use this much like a large club, spear, sword sort of thing. You will advance, you'll go for the squishy parts. Um, and you want to thrust, you want to turn it, and then pull it back out again. All right? It's got this nifty little kind of triangle to it because what you're doing is creating a puncture wound. Those of you that know your first aid, all right, puncture wounds very hard to, to close up. All right? Again, that's why you're going for these nifty meaty organs right here. Um, that and you get it back out again. So. Uh, but it's not terribly sharp. This is not sword play and all that goofy stuff, right? We're not going there. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, it's the other aspect of this. You use your flintlock to soften up the lines before you charge with your bayonet is the part of it. So, um, so yeah, this is definitely a big piece of this. Um, so, Dan. You don't shoot with the bayonet on. You can, actually. But it does throw off the, the balance uh, is the problem, and there's always the chance that the ball could bounce off of it by mistake is the thing. So, anyways, okay. Other questions about our flintlock? Yeah. How easy was it to actually hit someone with like the uh, bayonet part? Because it seems like it not, it's not like a spear. It's not really as wieldy as it would be. It seems like it would be relatively easy to kind of move to out. To deflect of it yeah. or, you know, or, yeah, or get out of the way and whatnot. Uh -huh. But you do have to remember the chaos and confusion that we were talking about, too. Um, that works to your advantage. Another thing about black powder, very smoky. Um, it's one of the reasons why we wear bright colors um, and have drums and flags and that sort of thing. Um, so that way you know the confusion and the chaos and all that and will work to your advantage or disadvantage, depending on which side you are. So, um, But, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good weapon. It's the best we got um, is the thing. So um, we'll be using these. We've still got them um, is the thing. So, anyways, uh, other questions? Yeah, Andrew? How cheap would they have been? Expense-wise, we're talking eh, probably a good year's wages. I mean, it's they're expensive, and again, that's another reason to maintain it. Um, you know, but it is something that you all would be required to have as members of the militia, as young men. So, um, anything? The thing, Katie, what do you say? So, how would the musket balls melted down from lead vary from the musket balls that they melted down from like statues and stuff? Because it's the same sort of thing. Because you, yeah, you use the same lead, and it's your lead. It may have like a pewter bit to it or whatever. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, it's just we're not too concerned about what the metal is. We just want that projectile to be able to to take them out. Um, is the thing. That's another thing. I mean, there's not nothing standardized. So um, you're just you know how much powder you put in your cartridge, how many, what size your balls are, all that sort of thing is just it's whatever you come up with. It's all personal. So um, I do want to say, do we have rifles? We do, all right, but they're very few and far between. By 1778, jumping ahead a little bit, only 3% of the weapons in the field are rifles. All right? That's really, really small. There's a lot of problems with rifles. Okay, They are longer, <clears throat> which is a challenge. The big thing is how long it takes them to load. We counted down our 20 seconds. Talk, let's t try talking two minutes to load a rifle. Right. It's got that sleeve. It's got those those grooves in there. You've got to put extra batting, extra cloth in there to be able to snug that down. It just takes that much longer. There's more steps to it. 
all those sorts of things. So, yeah, you are going to have an occasional, I don't want to call them snipers, but um, your scouts are going to be the ones that are going to have your, your rifles. But they are not, that's not what we're using mostly here in the field uh, is the thing. So, any other questions about our musket? Yeah. Oh, I, I know in one of our readings it mentioned, I think it was Prescott having, like, a saber. Is that just for, gen- like, commanders, and were they more ceremonial, or could they actually be used in close combat? Officers generally carry swords as a way to rally their troops um, and to command, you know, like, go this direction, go that direction, sort of thing. Um, yeah, I said look backwards like medieval and whatnot. We're not doing, like, the whole King Arthur and jousting and all that kind of stuff, uh, much fun as that would be. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's usually what they are, is it's, and it's definitely an officer's thing. Ordinary guy in the field is not going to be able to afford that. Um, he may be carrying, you know, um, a tomahawk or a small knife, but that's more for, for personal use than it would be for battle, I think. So, okay, why am I talking about this? Why am I spending so much time on this? All right, because... This is the, I keep saying it, this is the best that we've got. This is state-of-the-art technology, all right? This is going to determine what we can do in the field, all right? Technology dictates tactics. Again, you've got to remember the time period. You've got to remember what you're working with because there are certain things that we can do and certain things that we cannot do with this weapon. So things like the weather, all right? If it suddenly starts to rain, battle over, done. Okay, um, or um, you, there's all sorts of other uh, possibilities. Oh, the terrain. You've also got to remember that. If you're on a, sometimes the high ground is not always the best place to be um, necessarily. So um, you're not going to have, like I said, little snipers that are going to be pouncing on folks as far as ambushes and all that sort of thing. So um, it also explains why when you see all those movies, right, and the soldiers are all lined up and it, you know, and you're watching it with somebody else and they're like, looks ridiculous. Who would do that? That's just dumb. That's what you're doing. The essential job of this weapon is to fire a wall of lead into the enemy to soften them up so you can charge with the bayonet. All right. So this is all very, very different. So when we, ta- so when we finally do start fighting battles and whatnot, remember this, because this is, this is it. This is what we've got. This is what we're going with, is the thing. So, all right. That takes care of our weapon. Get rid of this. Now let's set up our army. Oops. All right. As far as the chain of command is concerned, and this is all ultra important, all right? Those are either military, well, and no matter what, always follow the chain of command. Don't jump. That's just rule of thumb there, okay? Um, All right. At the very top is going to be the Continental Congress. They are supreme. They are the ones we answer to. It'd be nice if they would supply us. Um, but, you know, we'll work on that. So, um, But going back to advantages and disadvantages, Congress really doesn't know what they're doing. Okay, they signed a Declaration of, pay, of Independence. Woohoo! Um, but as far as their powers are concerned, extremely limited. Okay, We had our list of what the Second Continental Congress could do. Print money, but not raise taxes. So, yeah, uh, that, that could be a real problem here. So, um, But this is where we start with the whole... S- Civil military complex, all right? Military answers to the government is the way it works here, all right? This is where it starts. Just below him is going to be your commanding general. And for us, who's that? George, yes. Who deserves his own holiday? Can I just say that? Okay? Because the man's just awesome. I mean, in so many different ways. But anyways, okay. Uh, George is going to get the job in June of 75. Uh, we already talked about this. But uh, because he wears the uniform to the, con- to the meeting of the Congress, look the part, fake it till you make it, um, he's, he doesn't have the most stellar career as far as uh, the military is concerned, but he does have experience. 
right? He's worked with the British, kind of knows the inside track as far as how those guys operate and whatnot. So, um, so that's an important thing too. He's also a Virginian, right? When we first start this war in 75, it is a New England thing. This was one of the complications we had when we were talking about, should we declare independence and all that stuff? When I say, yeah, it's just Boston, it's their problem and whatnot. By getting a Virginian to be in charge, you're going to get the, that help, that assistance from southern colonies, all right, which is hugely important. Also, Virginia is one of the wealthiest colonies you got, so you definitely want them on your side. Um, the way to score points with that is put George Washington in there. Um, he does his best. But he, is start, he, too, is starting from square one, right? When he first gets to the Boston, he's got to teach him how to dig latrines and how to cook food and basic hygiene, as well as drill the guys and figure out how to use the weapon and all that kind of stuff, as well as deal with the whole regional politics and whatnot. I mean, his, his work is definitely cut out for him. Um, and he doesn't... Not hating on George. He doesn't necessarily do the best of job at the beginning, but it's, again, it's, there's a huge learning curve here. He's got a lot to learn, a lot of different forces in the field. This is all a problem uh, for him, is the thing. So, um, and he's not always everybody's favorite choice, as we'll see. Right? Um, he has to fight for his job, too, and play the politics. <laughs> what fun. Um, so, poor George. He's got, got his work cut out for him here. So, Next, what you're going to have is your field army. These are your Continentals. That's me. They'll be led by either a major general or a brigadier general, whatnot, um, who will then answer to Washington. Washington's their main guy. Um, and they'll be deployed in various places throughout the colonies, um, depending on where the British are hanging out, um, is the thing. So, And then down here, is going to be your militia. Right. Again, these are your, your local defense force is the thing. So uh, I want to talk about militia here for a bit. Okay. As we've already said... <clears throat> Every man between the ages of 16 and 60 will be a member of your local militia. Right? You will maintain your firearm. You will attend drill once a month, or you'll be fined. Um, and you're the go-to guys. All right? If something happens, if there's some um, you know, disorder or uprising among other farmers or with some sort of enemy or the Indians arrive or whatever, these are the guys you call who grab their guns and go. Right? Um, like I said, local defense force is their important part. Right. Okay. And it's either your local town, usually your local county. We're divided mostly into counties as far as our, as far as our colonies are concerned is the thing. So, um, however, <laughs> as a force... For long term, we got some problems with these guys. Like what? What's what are some challenges you run into with militia? Um, as soon as it's farming time, that they want to go home and take care of their farm. Yes, they have self interest. That comes first. Whether it's farm, whether it's family, whether it's their business, that sort of thing. All right. Um, and again, we shouldn't diss on them for that. All right. This is because this is it's a voluntary sort of thing. Um, and so they're not required they're to be there necessarily um, for long term. So, yeah, harvest time is usually the big thing when you're going to lose most of them is the thing. So other problems you're going to run into. So, Cooper, what are you saying? Uh, undisciplined, especially in comparison to regular soldiers. Yeah. Okay. These guys pretty much do whatever they want. All right. Yes, you're supposed to drill once a month. Really, what you're probably doing is getting together on the green, camping out, and drinking a lot. Um, it happens. Um, I'm not, there are those that take it seriously, and I get that. Um, but really, as far as when shots are being fired and you're literally under the gun, it's, they're a force that is going to cut and run. 
um, is a thing. And they're, you know, they're unruly. Um, and they are hard to discipline because they are, they are a volunteer force. So when they do something wrong, you can't necessarily court-martial them or discipline them like you can regular troops. So keeping these guys in line, literally, is difficult um, to do. By it. So what else are things? No. Uh, they want to stay local. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We will run into several instances where these guys will not cross boundary lines. All right? That's not my colony. Not interested. All right? They're not going to leave the county. They're not going to leave the local, lo- local terrain and whatnot. So, um, so yeah, it's, they're a Virginian or they're a Carolinian. They're not an American. All right? Again, it's the local defense force. So they're keeping it local. Uh, what else sort of thing? The level of training, because it is a voluntary, you know, Mm -hmm. like if they do have time set aside to drill or something like that, it's not necessarily, like you said, what they're going to be doing. And so it's not going to be the same caliber as the field army or the British army. Sure, they get training. They get drill, oh, once a month and whatnot. And yes, you do know how to operate your weapon. I'm not trying to make them sound like a bunch of Yahoo country bumpkins or something. But nevertheless, working in concert, working together as a force that's just not their thing, all right? Um, and so, yeah, they don't have the, the, the discipline, the training and whatnot to be able to withstand a long campaign um, or even a long battle, for that matter. So um, what else? Other problems you run into? Compared, there's not that many of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, much fewer. All right. It consists of the guys in the county, all right? Um, and it's... A wide range of ages here, folks. <laughs> so it can be dad and all his and all his sons um, heading off together uh, is the thing. Um, but yeah, as far as numbers are concerned, it's whoever comes out, right? Um, and yeah, it's towns are small, and that's what you that's what you get to work with. Um, anything else? Other problem? Would they elect their leaders? Yes, they would. So let's elect our officers, shall we? So it does oftentimes to come into a, turn into a, a popularity contest as far as like, oh, yeah, who's providing the best ale? Um, that's the guy who's going to be our new officer. Just call me Major. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so that is a real problem um, because they're, they're, it's popularity, not merit. The guys who know what they're doing probably know better than to become an officer in the first place. But uh, anyways, other things, other problems you run into. So, um, Where did they get their funding they're, it's, they are self-funded, but you're absolutely, because it is a volunteer thing. But nevertheless, as far as supply and whatnot, you're right. How are we going to, you know, do we pay them? No. Are, so that's why they're not going to stay in the field very long. Um, how are we going to feed them? Well, they better bring their provisions with them, right? Um, and forage as you will. Um, so that's a problem, too. So, um, so yeah, what... How you supply is a big is a big difficulty. What else? Are there other problems with our? Yeah. Uh, I think particularly in the South, there were also militias that formed of loyalists. So there's no guarantee that they're going to be on your side. Sure, it's the there is the loyalty question. All right. And yes, in the South, this is one of the reasons why it's going to be so partisan, why it's going to be so ugly, is that it's often neighbor versus neighbor. That it's not necessarily which flag, which cause you support. It's, hey, you stole my cows. Or, I lost a court case to you. Or, you're, you know, I've hated your family since you got here. All right. Um, it's, it, it comes down to that being that personal is the thing. And, yeah, you can, you can switch sides is the problem, too. So, um, going back to our supply and stuff. Don't, we also don't have a uniform at all. Um, I'll be militia on Thursday, just so you know. Um, and so it's the only thing you need is your weapon. You just pretty much wear whatever you've got and off you go uh, is the thing. So, yeah, you, how do you tell who's friend, who's foe, right? Um, it, got, it becomes really, really challenging. Going back to the non-discipline thing, the ugly things that happen out there, all right? Um, things like, I don't know, spigoting your enemy where you... you basically put a, run a stake through their foot and whatnot to get them to talk uh, is real problematic. So um, there's all sorts of problems as far as their discipline. What else? Are there other problems with our, with our militia, other difficulties you run into? You can't expect them. They don't, they don't stay put. They're unreliable, all right? Both short-term and long-term. 
because, when, like I said, when they're under fire, they oftentimes will cut and run um, because they don't have the discipline, they don't have the training to stay put is the thing. Um, they aren't necessarily going to show, they aren't necessarily going to be long-term um, as far as soldiering is concerned. And you're not going to have them for weeks or months on end like you are a contracted soldier like you would with the, the Continental Army. So, um, so yeah, so we do have some problems here, but yeah. Wouldn't it also be difficult for them to work with the Continentals because the Continentals don't trust them and they think they're kind of a less qualified force? Sure, you absolutely run into huge problems. With trying. What we're going to have is we're going to have our, our militia who are supposed to answer to your Continentals. Continentals, like you said, they don't trust the militia because they've got this undisciplined, unre- unreliable sort of cut and run uh, uh, stereotype and whatnot. So um, yet they do have their advantages. It's getting the two to work together is the real challenge. Right? And every single battle, we're going to see this. Sometimes it's successful. Most of the times it's not. Um, but it's, they are a problem all right, um, to work with. Nevertheless, despite all these problems, I don't call them advantages, we'll call them benefits. I don't want to completely discount this force. All right. What are some benefits to our militia? What are some of the good things? Reasons we want. They're everywhere. Yes. They are. <laughs> Once again, as I was saying, every man is required to do this. So yes, no matter where you are, if you're in, you know, York County, Virginia, or you're in, you know, Poughkeepsie, New York, you're going to be able to pull these guys in. So what else? Other advantages? Kevin? They know the land better than anyone. They do. All right. They know the creeks and the, tr- and the rivers and the Indian paths and all those different places that nobody else knows, whether you're Continental Army, whether you're British Army, all those sorts of different folks. you got to know your terrain, folks, all right? And you can use that to your advantage um, as far as getting supplies, as far as, you know, being able to pick your battle, where that's going to happen, and using that to your best advantage. Um, this, you cannot discount how important this is here. So, but what else? So, Cooper. Did a large percentage of the of the militia have uh, war experience from fighting in the mm-hmm. French and Indian War? And again, they don't necessarily have to have experience in a cut and dry battle. They've got experience with that weapon. They've got experience, say, hunting. They've got experience just fighting in general is the, is part of that. And so, yeah, they're not necessarily you know disciplined as far as a force, but they're very comfortable in the field. Uh, is the thing. And so we can definitely use that to our advantage. So anything else? Other things? Um, They're more tight-knit since they know each other, Mm -hmm. like they've grown up with each other. Sure, they're connected. As I was saying, often it's that family ties, all right? Let's go get, you know, all the uncles and all the nephews and all the sons, and we're all just going off to war together. Um, And it's, but that, that family sort of thing, yeah, that really helps, again, going back to The advantages, it's your home, it's your family, it's your farm, and yeah, you're going to be that much more invested in protecting it and defending it. Um, And yeah, bring everybody out while you're at it. So um, what else? Other thing, Jennifer, what do you think? Um, You just touched on this, but they have more incentive to actually go fight because Mm -hmm. if it's on their land and on their farms, then they're going to want to defend it. Sure, going back to, again, the object, the advantages, it's their cause. That's what they're fighting for. That's what they're the most excited about uh, is the thing. So, um, so yeah, they're not going to leave their backyard because it's their backyard. That's why they're protecting it. That's what they're so excited about uh, is, the, is the part of that. So uh, anything else, other things? Yeah. Um, if they're self-funded, Congress doesn't have to worry about them as much as the continents. Sure, they can get a play on their, oops, put it down here. They can count on local supplies, all right, uh, is the thing. So, um, because they, again, they know the terrain. They also know where the friendlies are, um, where they can get food, shelter, um, all sorts of other supplies. And, yeah, they are self-funded, so they can operate without having to talk to Congress. Again, undisciplined um, and whatnot, it's, it's a problem, but it's also an advantage because they're a force that can do whatever they want, uh, basically, which, again, Good and bad. Double-edged sword. Do you get any individual colony support? They just—they can get some from 
you know, like um, from the county um, who might, you know, raise some monies and whatnot to um, accouter them properly or whatnot. Um, but um, but it's, they don't have to is the thing. It's more much more voluntary um, than anything else. So anyway, okay. Questions about our militia? Yes, Andrew. So if someone was on paper, like fully qualified to be in the militia, how hard was it for them to be disqualified? Pretty difficult. Actually, um, seriously, I mean, it's it's pretty much it's just about the it's the age requirement, and that's that's it. Um, and you're you go, um, or you can pay your fine and not go um, is part of it. But um, but yeah, it's just expected. And most men will go. I mean, it's part of being part of the the rights and privileges of being a citizen. Is this is what you do? Um, you vote. You are a member of the militia. You sit on a jury. You all those different things. It's just part and parcel of. Being a, of being a citizen, essentially. So, anyways, other questions about our militia? Okay, the other force in the field we need to think about is our Continentals. Created in June of 75. Thank you, Continental Congress. <clears throat> the trick with this is they will serve at first six months to one year. They will sign a contract. These guys are regular army. Right. With all the benefits of being like regular army which means you're going to have to obey orders, which means you're going to have to outfit them, uh, whether it's uniform, whether it's musket, whether it's uh, pay, which is a real challenge as far as our Congress is concerned, um, and supplies, which is also a problem as far as our Congress is concerned. Um, we're going to have some mutinies here. so um, But they have to stay. All right, That's one of the advantages of these guys. These folks, they come and go willy-nilly, whichever way they want to go. These folks... They have to go where they're told to go. You, know, you go to Philadelphia, or you go to New York, or you go to Valley Forge, or you go to Morristown, wherever. You got to follow orders as part of this. Um, so they are much more disciplined and trained. Now, a caveat to that is this is new. This is something that's, we, again, we're starting from scratch. George has got his work cut out for him. We don't have some, you know, major warehouse full of weaponry and uniforms and flags that we can then run out and accouter our guys and send them off to fight the British. We're starting from square one. These people, they're, they used to be militia. Now they're signing a contract. There's a lot of, there's a lot of play in here. I don't want to make it sound like these, this is army who's ready to go and take on the British army. It's going to take a long time, right? We're going to see the first couple of years, these guys need to get that experience. Yes, they have some experience. Yes, they've been fighting wars for quite some time now. But nevertheless, it's, it's a learning experience for them, um, especially in the long term. You also got to watch the timing, right? Sometimes battles will, the timing of battles will be determined on whether their contracts are going to expire. Because believe me, they're going to want to go home. After the experience that they've had, trust me, they kind of want to go home. So, um, so that's a part of this, too. Um, they have to stay for the length of their contract. And we do have the cause behind us, especially at first. Um, there's a historian that calls this the rage militaire. Um, that everybody, you know, everybody's all on board. We declare independence. We're going to go get the British. And everybody signs up on board because you're taking your sons and your brothers and your friends. And it all sounds like a great adventure until you've been there for four months, sitting around a campfire, starving and not getting paid, making lead balls for your flintlock and whatnot. So, um, so that it does fade over time, all right? Sure, one of the adva American advantages is the longer we draw this out, the longer British fatigue is gonna kick in. But the longer we draw this out, the longer American fatigue is gonna kick in as well. So you need to be careful about that, uh, is the thing. So. You also have to watch out for the fact that, like I said, these guys are regular army. We are very skeptical of that. All right. 
Think about all the experiences we've had before this with all those redcoats that are staying in people's houses, right? Or the quartering act and whatnot. It's why we broke away in the first place. Um, so we are very skeptical of how do we fund this professional army? How do we treat this professional army? That sort of thing. So you got to be really, really, di- really careful as far as our as far as the army is concerned. Um, don't automatically think that these guys know what they're doing because they don't. Um, the training that's it's going to take a while for all of that. So, um, and yeah, the same thing as far as your officers and whatnot. There's a lot of <laughs> go ahead and call it officer infighting. Who's in charge? Who deserves to be in charge? You know, Washington is not the most well-liked guy in the world. I hate to say it, it's true. Um, there's, you know, and there's other folks besides Charles Lee um, that we don't like uh, that, uh, that cause problems for him, all right? Um, and poor Washington, he's forever sending petitions to Congress to try and help out his Continental Army, and Congress is like, yeah, 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 we'll get to it. Someday, whatever. Um, so you do run into this sort of thing as well. I mean, and this is, this is typical army, that you're, not everybody gets along. All right? Yes, you have the same objective. Everybody's got a different way of the, they want to achieve that objective. All right? um, everybody's got to throw their two cents in, basically. So, um, so this, is, this is sometimes a problem as well. All right? um, so what we're going to have are both of these forces in the field at the same time. All right? Good things and bad things about that if you know how to do this right, you can use the advantages of both of these for these guys to you know, do their thing as far as I don't know, causing problems with the British um, and uh, you know, hitting their supply trains or um, wreaking havoc as far as the, uh, their supply lines are concerned. Um, and then relying on Continental Army to just come in and, and clean up as far as the regular battle is concerned. Right? It's going to take a long time for people to learn this. Washington served with British soldiers during the French and Indian War. He wants that traditional battle. He wants that, that win with honor. All right? Militia battles, not so much is the thing. So uh, sometimes this works. All right? Sometimes we'll see, you know, coming into Saratoga, that these guys do a great job softening up the enemy so these guys can come in and finish them off. Cowpens, perfect example of being able to use both of these to their advantage in the best possible scenario, right? But best possible scenario doesn't happen very often, all right? Um, there's a lot of forces at play here, all right? It's one of the reasons why it's going to take us several weeks to fight this war, why we're going to spend time looking at all these different battles, because each one's very different. There's always something to be learned here, the lesson learned away from that. So, um, so that's going to be a big part of this. It's complicated, folks, all right? And that's, that's war, as far as that, but anyways. Okay, questions about our Continental Army? Anything? Okay, so last thing we need to do, uh, the key point, as I said, these each play have, have important and supportive roles to play. Um, last thing I want you to remember before I, uh, is, is the Continental Army is made up of real people. All right? This is not a game. This is not X's and O's on a field somewhere that we're just, you know, pretend and whatnot, all right? Sure, it happened 250 years ago or whatever. These were real men. These were real soldiers who went off and fought and died so that way we could be the people that we are today and enjoy the freedoms that we have, all right? We need to remember that as we're going forward with this, all right? If anything, we need to, we need to, to honor their sacrifices. And I don't care what your politics are, okay? Um, it's... There are men and women today, right now, that are sacrificing their lives, their time, to be able to protect us, to keep us safe, so we can do this, so we can have a class. All right? um, we can enjoy the rights that we have, is the thing. So, uh, and it starts here, all right? that, that, that tradition, basically, that military tradition. And it's hugely important. All right? So one thing I do when I do military history is I always carry my combat boots with me. So we'll always have these up here. So... Um, there's a phrase, that, a modern phrase that they use. It's called boots on the ground. I'm not a fan of that phrase because it gets misconstrued. It's, it's too impersonal. It makes you forget that there, are not, that there are real men, real women who are wearing these boots, who are off doing things to be able to keep us safe. All right? And we need to remember that. So every time we 
fight a battle, I'll have my little boots here, um, to remind us of those people. And like I said, it's been a long time, 250 years since we fought this war with these guys, with our Continental Army, with George, with the militia, all right? Um, yeah, we need to honor their sacrifice as the thing. So we also need a new cheer because you all voted for independence, all right? Um, and so we can't yell, God save the king anymore. Um, but what we do in, in uh, 1775, we yell hip, hip, huzzah. We don't say hooray yet. We say huzzah. It's the 18th century way is the thing. So, um, and so as a last thing, uh, I'd like to offer up uh, in, in honor of, the, of soldiers near and far, especially those in our past, we need three cheers for George Washington and our Continental Army, and let's not forget the militia, all right? Hip, hip. Huzzah. Hip, hip. Huzzah. Hip, hip. Huzzah. Company dismissed. Okay. We pass back your exam and we'll be good to go. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Q&A podcast. Our guest this week is Wall Street Journal economics editor and columnist David Wessel, author of Only the Rich Can Play. He talks about the creation of opportunity zones and discusses the impact they have had. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts and on the new C-SPAN Now app.